Just like any other kind of infrastructure, railroad track is ultimately an expendable resource, requiring periodic reconstruction or rehabilitation to remain in top operational form. While the large steel rails of today's railroads are hardy and can last for decades, over time they are surface worn by passing trains and are subjected to stress and strain which precipitates in the formation of metal fatigue and internal cracking. While rail grinding does extend the life of the rail, eventually it becomes more cost effective to swap it out for new steel. Here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, CSX has elected to replace the high side rail through the curve here at Seymour. Curve rail is typically replaced much more frequently than straight rail due to increased wear on the railhead from the wheel flanges and lateral loading not typically seen on the straightaways. As we arrived this morning, the CSX crew was just beginning to unload their equipment from the specially designed train it arrived on. A foldable ramp on the last car allows the equipment to roll directly off the train and onto the track, so they'll be getting to work shortly. What we're seeing here is the rear end of the work group, which consists of 17 on-track machines. They roll east past the starting point of today's work, from which they'll progress back west by our location. In turn, we will see the entire process from start to finish, from the original worn out track to the finished product. The first step actually requires the fourth machine in the convoy to get things started. Because the rail unloading crew only dropped rail on the east side of the crossing, the piece from the west side must be moved into position. For this, the first excavator grabs on and drags the new ribbon of rail right over the crossing, with the guys on the ground protecting the roadway for this unusual movement. Also staged by the excavator at this point is the transition rail, needed because the new rail is the now standard 136 pounds per yard versus the old 122 pounds per yard it will be tying into. This shop fabricated segment eliminates the need for compromised joint bars or a field weld, allowing the rail to remain continuous through the size change. As we can see, the new rail is being staged in the middle of the track for logistical reasons which will soon become apparent. With the new rail staging complete, all of the machines move back east to the start of this curve. The two men here are measuring out where the rails will need to be cut and clearing out ballast from under those points. The first machine in line is a large rail saw fabricated by Sperling Railway Services. Its primary mission is to cut both the old and new rails where needed with speed and efficiency using a hydraulically powered blade. The operator simply lines up the saw, which is then clamped to the rail, and then positions a spark shield before activating the blade. The shield not only protects any nearby workers, but also greatly reduces the risk of starting any brush fires.
Within minutes, the saw operator had the cuts on both sides of the crossing complete. Following immediately behind is a web grinder, which cleans the surface of the rail web for the eventual needs of the flashbutt welding process, which we'll discuss more about when the time comes. Next up are the spike pulling machines, which do exactly as the name implies. This crew has a pair of Nordco built machines, which quickly pull the spikes out of the track. Typically, if the rail is being replaced with new material of the same size, only the spikes which hold the rail in place will be removed. However, with the new railway upgrade on this project, new tie plates will also be installed, so the hold down spikes are also coming out. One last step which has to be completed before the old rail comes out is the removal of any signal wires by a maintainer. Failure to proactively remove these wires can cause significant headaches in the form of rapidly damaged signal wiring. Finally, it is time to remove the old steel. In order to make way for the excavator's threading attachment, the first few feet need to be stripped of their anchors with a sledgehammer. Next, a rail claw swiftly picks up the end of the rail and a steel box is slid underneath to hold it, and then the threading attachment is picked up by the excavator. Once slid over the end of the rail, it allows the operator to quickly thread the old rail off to the side in a process which also swiftly removes the anchors.
It's always impressive to see just how flexible rail really is, despite its great weight. This short 200 foot segment, for instance, weighs about 4 tons, but it seems more like a boiled noodle than solid steel. The next few machines feature crawler tracks since they obviously cannot rely on both rails being present. The first of these is a Spurling Rail Scrap Retriever, which features a magnetic conveyor belt used to pick up the old spikes, tie plates, and anchors. Uniquely, this machine features a remote control, allowing the operator to walk with the machine and toss any items missed by the belt. Meanwhile, the machine drops the scrap into an onboard bin, which when full is dumped into a pile next to the track. Ultimately, a cleanup crew with a boom truck equipped with a large electromagnet will come by and pick up all of the scrap piles for a proper disposal. The next machine is a Spurling tie plugger, which is definitely the messiest machine in the group. Using the attached dispensing guns, the machine and its operators feed a two-part chemical compound into the holes left from the recently removed spikes. The compound quickly hardens and effectively plugs the old holes, allowing new spikes to be driven in their place. Without the compound, new spikes in the old holes would be useless at holding down the new rail. Rolling up next is a Knox Kershaw Cribber Adzer, which serves both functions its name suggests. The brooms on either end sweep away the ballast from the top of each tie, clearing the way to set the new tie plates into place. Meanwhile, the machine also adges, or notches, each tie so that the new plates will sit flush on each tie with the proper alignment. With the ties properly prepared, the new tie plates are set into place. With all of today's mechanization, it is essentially the last fully manual job on a rail crew. With the tie plates installed, it's time to thread in the new rail. One trick of the trade is to place a spike in the first hole, allowing the operator to quickly line up the end of the new rail. Once this end is in place, they roll on down the line, threading the rail into place using the boom and high rail wheels. The operator must be careful, however, to try and keep the track gauge, or else the machine will fall off the rail onto the ground with a nice thud.
The next machine is in my opinion the coolest in the convoy, but in literal terms it is the hottest. With a beastie looking back end, this progress rail in-track welding truck makes quick work of fusing rails together with the power of flash butt welding. While newer machines are capable of doing all the lineup work automatically, this machine still requires the crew to properly align the rail heads with hand jacks. A sleeve is then inserted over the gap, and the welding apparatus is lowered on and clamps onto each rail. This is where the grinding work from earlier comes into play, as the machine uses a ton of electric current to melt and then fuse the rail heads together. That cleaner surface left by the grinding thus allows for a better electrical contact between the machine and the rail. The welding process itself is highly automated and begins by feeding electric current between the two segments of rail, which are still separated by a slight air gap. This causes the current to arc across the gap creating a great amount of heat and sparks. Once the rail is properly heated, the apparatus pushes the rails together, essentially casting a new joint on the spot. This process offers significant advantages over traditional thermite welding, which adds new material in order to make the weld. This new material does not match the metallurgy of the rails themselves, and thus forms a potential weak point in a spot which tends to wear differently from the rail itself. But because this flash butt welding process simply melts what is already there, the final joint has very similar characteristics to the surrounding rail, producing better rail performance with a lower risk of failure over time. When the apparatus has signaled that it is finished with the process, it lifts away to reveal the fresh weld, which is still insanely hot and will remain so for some time. Moving in next is a Nordco production spiker gauger, which will ensure the new rail is properly spaced at 56 and a half inches from the opposite rail, and then spike down every fifth tie to set the gauge. Behind the machine, the gauge is checked with a trusty tape measure just to ensure the machine is setting the gauge correctly. Following the spiker is a rail heater, which is not in use today because the weather is playing nice and the rails are already at their neutral rail temperature. At this temperature, around 90 degrees in this area, the rail is neither in tension nor compression due to thermal expansion or contraction and is thus the standard temperature at which the rails should be when they are laid down and tied in with the existing rail. To expand upon this point, if the neutral rail temperature is too low, 
Warm weather will create the risk of track kinks due to overloading the rail with compression force due to thermal expansion. Conversely, if the neutral rail temperature is too high in cold weather, excessive tension forces can cause the rail to snap. Thus given an area's climate, a suitable temperature to balance the seasonal thermal loads is chosen and all rail is laid at or in reference to that temperature. This may then require that the rail be heated, but as mentioned, on this day, the rail was already at its happy point. Working between machines, the signal maintainer gets back to reinstalling any necessary signal wiring. In this case, because the in-track welder wasn't able to reach this close to the crossing, a new bond wire must be installed to bridge over the new, temporary mechanical joint. The bond wire will ensure good electrical continuity between the rails until such time that the local track forces eliminate the joint with a traditional thermite weld. The next pair of machines are identical Nordco anchor applicators. These relatively simple machines install the rail anchors on each side of the tie, which keep the ties from sliding up and down the track or becoming slewed. This also helps to reduce longitudinal movement of the rail itself, which aids in controlling the thermal expansion and contraction dynamics on this continuously welded rail. Two more Nordco production spiker gauges are next, which work in tandem to finish driving out all of the spikes. The first machine hammers home the rail holding spikes, while the second will drive in the hold down spikes further out on the tie plate. With the track now physically complete again, the last machine in the work group arrives, which is a Nordco rail anchor cart. However, on rail gang, CSX uses it as a platform to power hydraulic grinding tools used to finish off the rail welds. The first grinding pass is made with a hand grinder, removing most of the excess material from the weld. Next, the hydraulic quit disconnect hoses are moved over to this contraption, which grinds the railhead smooth over the weld. It is critical that this step be done to satisfaction to prevent excess wear or corrugation resulting from a rough weld. Back on the other side of the crossing, the signal maintainer has nearly finished rebonding the electrical leads for the signal system to the new rail.
And with that, the work of a railroad rail replacement gang is complete. In a series of choreographed steps, the crew efficiently removed the old worn rail and replaced it with fresh steel. Using a variety of specialized machines, the work is rather straightforward and certainly much easier than the manual labor of days gone by. Special thanks to this crew for graciously allowing me to film their work and be good sports about it. It isn't always easy working in front of an unknown camera lens, but I think this process is so neat and worth sharing with others. I hope that after watching this video you have come to appreciate the process and honest work these guys do to keep trains rolling. Thanks for watching this edition of the Thornapple River Rail Series. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and leave any questions down in the comments below.